Friends and colleagues, it's a great honour to introduce our keynote speaker. He's claimed by many. He is African. He is Nigerian. He is a Londoner. And at the Commonwealth Foundation, we're no different. We try and claim him too. Not least because he won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in 1987. Yes, he's an internationally acclaimed writer of poetry and prose. He was the youngest winner of the Booker Prize in 1991, and he's had no less than six honorary degrees conferred on him. But we didn't ask him to speak to us because of the prizes or the degrees. His writing on the Grenfell disaster in this country and his reflections on the nature of citizenship brought home his gift for challenging orthodoxy and contesting apparent realities. I would say that he is the perfect person to open this gathering of Commonwealth civil society. But I would feel sure that he would then go on to contest my imperfect notion of perfection. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Ben Ockrey. Good morning, everybody. I can't tell you how, uh, how much of a special pleasure it is to be here today. Um, I want to thank um, Min and uh, Vijay Krishna, Krishnarayan for their great faith in, in me, which I think is somewhat unjustified. My talk today will be in three parts, and um, if you don't mind, I would like to speak in a manner that I've not spoken before, directly, highly elusively, and very mysteriously. <laughs> I don't promise to come to any conclusions. I think conclusions are risky. And in our world, conclusions even are possibly dangerous. I think we should be discoverers of possibility, not concluders. We should be explorers of spirit and ideals, and not full stoppers. We should not be full stops. We should be more semicolon, maybe even a dash certainly a, a sign that leads to the future rather than stops and says, this is it. This is never it. I'm improvising now. Um, I'm going to be talking on three different levels. I shall speak as an oral storyteller. I shall speak as an old-fashioned intellectual speech giver. And I shall also be a poet. They conform to the three levels of, the, of society that I grew up in, uh, the three levels of family and community. The storyteller is my mother, intellectual is my father, the poet is me. So I'll start with a story. I don't know if you've heard this story before, but it's one of my favorite mother, mother telling stories. Do you like stories? I've met some people who don't like stories. <laughs> they are full stops. <laughs> My mother tells a story of uh, a frog who uh, unfortunately found itself in a frying pan. And uh, in this frying pan there was uh, some water. And uh, under the frying pan with water, you have to understand why my mother tells this story. She accompanies it with gestures. So she will hold her hand out like that, and that's the frying pan. 
and every gesture she made, I, I, I imagined what she was referring to. So you, you need to see a frying pan in my hand with water in it and this frog in the water and underneath it, a fire. Well, the fire was at first very gentle and the heat in the water was quite imperceptible. And the temperature in the water changed imperceptibly. And the frog was in the water while this water temperature changed imperceptibly. And imperceptibly the water, the temperature changed till, and I'm going to do a mom thing here, where you leap from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, till it was boiled to death. Now it was boiled to death because at every moment in the water, the change of temperature was imperceptible. So at any given time, the frog would say, the water is fine, it's room temperature here. But actually, the temperature was very minutely changing till it was dead. When mom tells me this story, she never gives an interpretation of the meaning of the story. She just ends it and leaves it to me. And sometimes it would take me 30 years <laughs> to work out the complicated implications of what she's saying. Our world, its temperature is being imperceptibly changed. The air, the atmosphere, its toxicity, its dangers, imperceptibly changed in its temperature, day by day, month by month. Things happen, we treat them as reality, as normality. And we're being slowly boiled. And my job as a poet is to occasionally get up and say to the frog, you're being slowly boiled to death. And your job is to say to your world and the world that you represent and work with that we are all being slowly boiled to death. And that we need a new awareness of the minutely changing temperature of our times. Here comes the dad part. Sometimes it strikes me that we are not aware of the power that we have. It seems to me that we perceive ourselves from the limited lens of the past. And even the past was not clearly perceived. We read our future through our past. And our present seems merely the midwife of that future. But maybe it is time, given the state of the world, in which we begin to reconfigure the perception of ourselves into something new. It seems to me the world is crying out for a new kind of inspired, practical, and visionary leadership. The big nations of the world are lost in their different kinds of egoistic and nationalistic paralysis. They can be seen as living evidence that power is empty and possibly dangerous without vision. Actually, they are evidence of the fact that power is not really power without vision. It is really merely just force. It seems to me that the real question that we need to be asking ourselves is not who we are, 
or where we have come from, or even what our history has made us. It seems to me that for too long we have paralyzed ourselves with this excessive chewing of our navels. We have twisted ourselves into knots about our past and what has been done to us and how our hands have been tied and how the arena of the world seems shut off from us by the big powers. I think the most urgent question is where we are going. Or to put it another way, who do we want to be? I believe that it is this question answered fully and in the right way, in the noblest, most generous way, it is this question that can not only propel us to a new destiny, but can also give a richer and more wonderful and unexpected meaning to our pasts, whatever that past may be. A passing, I'm using a poetic phrase here, a passing of the world today reveals that the politics of the world is mostly bedeviled by nations, by leaders indulging in fraudulent, nostalgic nationalism. And that they have succeeded in taking their nations with them on this dangerous journey into a past that never was. Most nationalism is about a longing for a past that never was as the nationalists invoke it. And given a choice between hope and nostalgia, it seems that during elections, people prefer nostalgia. The reasons are quite simple. Nostalgia requires no effort. The past is comfortably in the past. It has happened. It was real, we think, and all we have to do is reach back to it and turn back the clock. Call it, if you like, the Gatsby factor. You can't go back to the past, but of course you can, old sport. <laughs> Nostalgia is easy because people forgot what it was really like to live in the past. And what is worse, they are wholly unaware of why the past is the past, which is to say, unaware of the unavoidable forces which compelled the past to change into today. It seems that politicians who claim to be realists are not really realists. They sell us fears and they sell us a kind of moral laziness and wishful thinking. They appeal to the laziest aspects of the human spirit. In that sense, they keep the times backwards. But what we need are people who can move the times forwards. People who can see where we are now, where the world truly is, or where the place that matters to us truly is, whether it be one's home, one's work, one's life, or one's nation. The basis of vision is always that of seeing clearly, seeing how things are, not how we wish them to be, not how we think they are, not even what we hope they are, but what we need, therefore, our perception of how things are. What we need are truth tellers. We need to know where we are to know where we need to get to. Only truth seers can give us true visions. For visions are not things of faith. A vision is not a thing of hope. A vision is a scene of where we are transfigured by what we are. When people think they're making true forecasts about the world, they're often describing where things are only. They give us one side of the equation, and from that they predict what will happen. 
They measure us by the external factors, the visible realities. This is, the, this is the limitation of economists, political pundits, columnists, pollsters, and experts. At best, they can tell us how things have been and how things probably look now. But they always miss an essential element of the alchemy of our possibility. They do not consider, they never think to look into, they never dream of the dimension of what we are. They always miss out the fourth dimensional factor, the fifth dimensional factor, the element of surprise in human affairs, the element of mystery in history, the quantum unpredictable element of the human spirit. Many of us come from nations that have been measured backwards, but rarely measured upwards. But finally, in this world, it is not how others measure us that counts. Many of us have lived in the shadow of this outward measurement. We have allowed others to define us and have even innocently allowed these definitions of us to take form and enmesh our destinies in limitation and restraints, in constrictions and want. And then from those very conditions caused by their definition, has then been used to justify their definitions in the first place in a wonderful exegesis of the self-fulfilling prophecy. For example, as a minor indulgence in digression, why are certain societies called post-colonial? And, and why is this post-colonial period seen as maybe the last hundred years? The effect of that rubric, and the reason why I somewhat despise it, is that its trick is to focus the discourse of the life of such nations on the past, on the colonial past. It is a way of keeping that always alive, psychologically, in the minds of a certain people. In that way, they can never be free from a perception of history. In that way, they can only see themselves from that viewpoint as if the only defining thing about the lives of those people is that viewpoint. With such a rubric, you're not allowed to see yourself as human, as free, as capable of determining your destiny. You are encouraged through language to always be chained to the colonial past, when in fact to many of us that past is less than a thin rope that binds the feet of the grown elephant. But the fact is, continuing this digression, that all nations are post-colonial. Britain is post-colonial in relation to Rome. America is post-colonial in relation to Britain. Rome is post-colonial in relation to Greece. And Greece is post-colonial in relation to Egypt. Egypt. <laughs> I love your interaction. Thank you. <laughs> throw in, throw in suggestions as I go along. This is a mutual speech. <laughs> and according to Plato, we're all post-colonial in relation to Atlantis. And archaeologists say that we're all post-colonial in relation to the very, very ancient beginnings of Africa. So do you see that if you go back far enough, how ridiculous this idea is? That is why allowing ourselves to be externally de de defined is the beginning of submitting to psychological and historical tyranny. It is the beginning of the death of our true freedom. And with the death of our true freedom, our inner freedom, the freedom to determine ourselves and the perception of ourselves, with the loss of that freedom, we lose something even more fundamental. We lose the element of mystery that is the true transforming factor in human affairs, in the unfolding of our historical and spiritual possibilities. We lose the power to transform our futures with the awakened axis of the present. I think it is time to measure ourselves, to dream ourselves, to compel ourselves upwards. There are now in the world, there are now in the world powers that think only, mainly, of their own needs, their own spheres. Perhaps the time when we could 
hope to think that the great nations will think of the benefit, the good of all humanity. Maybe the time to think that great nations will think of the benefit of all, of all humanity is over. Maybe the time of humanistic idealism is over. Maybe this is the age of deadly pragmatism. I think this is a shame and a loss. But we have to accept the countenance of our times. Only diminishment and shameful dependency are, are inflicted on those who do not bravely face the countenance of their times. It seems to be a time that has paradoxically a tendency to fragment and a tendency to make nations look inwards. It seems to be that for this reason, the word unity has a more powerful and pragmatic meaning than ever before. It is only with the strength of unity, the unassailable compactness of unity, that we can withstand the scattering forces all around us. And unity seems to me to suggest great fidelity to a central organic idea, fidelity to a central principle. It would seem that the idea of the Commonwealth needs redefinition in our times. The word itself has a distinguished pedigree. It prefaced the works of philosophers and social thinkers. Originally, it suggested wealth held in common, things done for the benefit of a people who lived or thought in common, who shared, who shared certain ideals or were bounded by common territory. It has come to mean a loose alliance of nations, not quite a federation, united by a common history. In this case, it is a case of a somewhat transfigured history of a troubled and contested past. Colonialism transformed itself into the Commonwealth in a brilliant stroke of making something lasting out of a historical bond which to some involves trauma, but to others involved gain. But we have to make something good come out of history, no matter how awful some contest that history to have been. It is all we can do with history. It is certainly better to make something good come out of history than to bear an eternal grudge and, or worse, to live in the long centuries of revenge and the revenging of revenge and all the bitterness and unforgiveness and cruelty and wasted opportunities for human growth that this hatred and rage involves, which we can see sometimes in the Middle East. I want to take a, a little brief meditation here on what I see as the magic of the Commonwealth. Um, I, think the, I think there's something incredibly unique about the Commonwealth. Unlike many other uh, nations that gather together under an idea like the European Union, or the G7. The Commonwealth is extraordinarily rich in nations and their different dreams, their different traditions, different histories, different cultures. And I think it is this rich tapestry of difference coming together so that our differences and our unique geniuses can be in conversation. I think that is what is so unique about the Commonwealth. I think the diversity is magical in that sense. I think it is in some ways the true ideal of humanity. I also think that its force and possibility is still only in its infancy. I think it, we are the real direction that the world has to go towards, towards plurality with unity at its heart. And I think, therefore, you must, be, you must have confidence in that richness that you represent, the richness of the diverse genius 
of our different origins. But making something good out of history does not mean being blind to the residual effects that history has on us, on our psyches, and the importance of purging that so that we can be free to remake ourselves in accordance with our best dreams and the best contributions we can make. But what form must this purging take? I think it takes facing the truth about what we are, all of what we are, what we are in ourselves and what history has made us. Facing the truth of that, but not accepting this as all of the truth of what we are, for we are also what we do. We are primarily makers of selves. We ought to be. We ought to be able to take whatever truth we need to face and with determination shape from that a life and more and a way more in tune with what we could be. Many of our societies are riven with poverty and inequality and injustice. How can we be a force in the world when our people suffer, when our people have insufficient, decent hospitals and poor roads and unsatisfactory housing? And yet, how can our society provide for these things if they're not effective players in the world? The two things seem to me to be linked. It seems there can't be proper justice in our nation if there isn't justice in the world. But then, how can there be justice in the world if there isn't justice in our nations, in our homes? But to press the thought further in a pragmatic vein, what is it that makes justice possible? Justice doesn't happen by itself. Justice doesn't emerge from the breasts of people, from the hearts of nations. Justice does not emerge much as we would like it to from common sense. The truth of the world is a hard truth. And if we are to be effective in the world, we better make our peace with the hard and uncomfortable truths. There are only two conditions through which justice emerges, it seems to me. The sense of the higher law within, as Kant might have called it, or a higher force in the world. The higher law within can be called conscience, morality, or nobility of spirit. It could also be called compassion or a sense of connectedness with fellow human beings. Unfortunately, the higher law within is easy to disregard, to not pay attention to. And being deaf to its entreaties is pretty much the broad story of humanity. I think it is unwise to base any appeals in this world, in the life of nations, on this sense of the inner law within. One might listen to it, but bigger nations with agendas of conquest and self-aggrandizement may pay no attention to it. The only thing we can truly count on in this world, whether you're a small nation or a little tribe or an individual or a minority of any kind, is the higher force in the world. But does this force have to be a force of arms, of weapons, of nuclear arsenals, or weapons of mass destruction? Are these the only things that constitute the higher force in the world? I believe there is another higher force. It does not have a nuclear arsenal. It does not have the military might and the spending power of the big nations. It does not have the anaconda grip of the mighty corporations. It does not have extensive spy networks and secret organizations for undermining the legitimate wills, le legitimate will of peoples. It has no force of lobbies, diplomatic core, or what is called in the pragmatic parlance of the world, wielding a big stick. This higher force is one of the mysterious elements that alters in ways incalculable and unseen the motions of history. It is the higher force that leaders we later call great harness to alter history and then somehow get all the credit for themselves. This higher force can sometimes be, be blindly swayed towards evil, 
but mostly its inclination, its swing, its destiny is toward the good. One ought not to give it a name, for to name is often to diminish, to simplify, to fix. But one ought to name it roughly, so we have a sixth sense of its unalterable presence, its inevitable presence in the emotions of the world. Often this higher force seems passive and at rest. Often it seems invisible. Often it seems weak. And often it seems non-existent and malleable. But that is only to perceive its power in the short term. In the long term, it is not weak, but strong. The strongest thing there is among us. And in the long term, it is not malleable, for it tends towards the highest, knowingly or unknowingly. What is this higher force? I shall call it the secret will for the magnification of the human. I can't think what else to call it. Please don't get hung up on the phrase I used. Instead, respond to the phrase with your intuition, with the depths of your humanity, with your imagination even. But this higher force I mention is real. It is the force behind history, which wanders many roads that we judge in temporal and limited perception, but whose ultimate destiny we do not know. I think we must work with this force for the betterment of our people. It really does come down to what kind of world we want to create. It also depends on what kind of world we find acceptable. I am hoping that you do not find the world as it is now acceptable. There will be no point your being here if you did. The world is not how we made it, but how we find it. The world is also what we collectively allow it to be. And that allowing is a passing on of power to others. It is allowing our beings and our wills to be the vacuum in which those who do not allow but seize can work through the vacuum of our willlessness to create a world which we then accept as fact. In short, we either will or we are willed on. We either dream or we are dreamed for. We either act or we become the theater of the action of others. Our world is defined by power but it is also defined by the abdication of power. Of the two, it is the abdication of power which affects us most. Those of us who should be helping shape our world but end up being shaped by the untrammeled forces of corporations and monster institutions that now shape every aspect of our lives from the internet to the ordinary everyday economic choices we make. I'm not, I am not here to make a coherent speech. That I can do anytime, anywhere, and have done frequently. I am here to ring an unruly bell. I am here to try and wake us up in the garden of nightmares and wonders that modern life has become. We are the guardians of our world, and I say there is danger in the garden. The giants are stirring and have woken and are taking over this beautiful space given to us in the interlude of the stars. Every now and again, we need to be roused from the beauty of our sleep into the unease and disturbances that is taking over our world. There is no use pretending anymore that the mysterious law of the garden would, of itself, right the course of human history. For we are a part of that mysterious law and upward impetus of civilization, 
for we are a part of that mysterious law, comma, <laughs> and the upward impetus of civilization depends on our being present to our times and playing our part in its redemption and transformation. We are what the world has called forth to make the future worthy of us and to be worthy of a future which we must help to shape. Recently, I've been saying that we need a new language to address the complex challenges of our times. We need a new language that speaks to power. We need a new language that is itself power, but an altogether new kind of power. The power of those who never thought themselves powerful, but upon whom the pillars of the world rests. In ancient mythology, Atlas held up the world on his shoulders. And for a day, one day, Hercules did it too to help fulfill some quest he had for the apples of the Hesperides. I take these complex metaphors for the mysterious force that sustains creation and how sometimes humanity is called upon to perform a godlike work of helping nature. We are the agents of nature and the commissioners of the invisible force that drives history. We are the angels and demons of mythology, depending on how we use our silent power. For there is the power of nations and there is the power of humanity. The power of humanity is transnational and this age of digital connectedness makes the power of humanity for good or ill more real than ever before. A core force is unleashed in the world when we become aware that we are the light and power that make it all happen. Our solidarity can alter history, our yes can transcend obstacles and create new futures. We are the secret will for the magnification of the human. We are the angels placed in the garden of history. But angels sometimes fall and forget what they are. Then the garden becomes hell. But we are the possibility and the difference makers. And our primary job, apart from working in our different spheres, is also to alter the tone of the world, alter the environment of thought and feeling. Right now, the wrong thoughts seem to be winning. So our job, I think, is not only working on the ground, but working on the atmosphere of the world, spreading seed thoughts for a new acceptable future so that they may blossom in the secret will that makes change inevitable. I want to end with a poem in accordance with the three-tier description I gave earlier. I'll make it very short. You can't remake yourself. You can't remake the world without remaking yourself. Each era begins within. It is an inward event with unsuspected possibilities for inner liberation. We could use it to turn on our inward lights. We could use it to use even the dark and negative things positively. We could use the new era to clean our eyes, to see the world differently, to see ourselves more clearly. Only free people can make a free world. Infect the world 
with your light. Help fulfill the human prophecies. Press forward the human genius. And please say this last line with me together. Our future is greater than our past. Our future is greater than our past. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Ben Opry.